Welcome to the Real Comic Heroes Podcast. Your adventure into the world of comic book movies starts here. Greetings, citizens, and welcome to another adventure of the Real Comic Heroes Podcast. My name is Travis from Watchmen Minute. And I'm Patrick with special guest. And I'm I'm Zachy Hassan. Hi, I'm I'm coming to you from San Francisco. All right on. Oh, all the way over in San Fran. Nice. <laughs> I've been there. It's uh, got an excellent transportation system. It does. Got to ride the BART, all kinds of fun stuff. <laughs> and, well, you, and you pay for it. Uh, living, living here is uh, a constant stress on your pocketbook. <laughs> oh, I can totally see that. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully the next, you know hour and a half or so we'll we'll try to relieve some stress and talk about robocop 2 Ooh. <laughs> yeah that screams no stress robocop <laughs> 2 a fun jaunty romp yeah of a, a light-hearted i guess it could make tale. you think oh san francisco's not so bad yeah, i was about to yeah. say yeah i mean i prefer <laughs> that to old detroit <laughs> <laughs> Yes, so RoboCop 2 from, what are we, in 1990? Yep, still yeah. 1990. Yeah. Start of the it, 90s. It, this movie felt, it felt so much like it was still in the 80s, you know, which, I mean, 1990, I guess it's still basically yeah, is the... Yeah, transitioning. The, the 80s, yeah. yeah. Um, Patrick, you got some uh, taglines to hit us with? Kind of. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> They're not very inspired, but ah. sequels rarely are. Yeah. Um, so we got two. We've got... He's back to protect the innocent. Yeah, I think I remember seeing that one on the uh, the poster. Yeah, and then this one eh, kind of tells you what the movie's about, at least, I guess. Even in the future of law enforcement, there is room for improvement. <laughs> but pretty lackluster tagline. Yeah, yeah, that's not great. Basically tells you what the movie's about, at least, but <laughs> that's about it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. very uninspired. Okay. <laughs> Much like this film, I think it's just riding the <laughs> coattails of the first one. Yeah, yeah. Um, so. Well, I'm kind of curious. Uh, we always like to ask what uh, everyone's history with the the movie is. Uh, Zachy, I'd love to know what yours is, um, and uh, particularly like why you, you know, wanted to be on on this particular episode to talk about RoboCop two. Well, it's you know I th I think uh, for me uh, what, the way I describe RoboCop two is it's not a good movie, but I still like it. You know, okay. <laughs> and and I I always have to hedge that. Like I th I think the original RoboCop is just it's legitimately great, and I think you guys would agree it's legitimately a classic. You know, every, it checks all the boxes, and uh, the sequel is is not those things necessarily. But I give it points for really swinging for the fences, and it was doing something, or it was trying to do something. And even when it didn't succeed, you kind of say, well, this is still pretty subversive for a big Hollywood picture, and I can appreciate it for that. Uh, and and uh, unlike the, the third film, where they, just, they completely sold out, and they're like, ah, let's just make it for kids. This one, it, they were still trying to uh, remain, you know, edgy. And plus, mm -hmm. it's you know, it's the it's the only other time we get Peter Weller as RoboCop. So how can yeah, you sure. not have at least a little bit of affinity for it? Yeah, right on. I mean, that's yeah. a good, pretty good synopsis of yeah, uh, positive end of the movie, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I will I will say like one one positive one you know good thing that this movie has going on uh, is that it does feel like a comic book, right? Uh, probably more so than a lot of movies that we actually talk about. Like this one feels like very comic booky and i'm sure a lot of that probably has to do with uh frank miller being involved in the writing at least i think in the screenplay but this was uh as far as i can remember watching it for this was definitely the first time i'd ever seen the movie um none of it felt familiar you know so i, I don't think i had ever seen this as a kid so this was this was the first time going into it and it probably it probably didn't didn't uh help you know um, <laughs> watching it for the first time like now but uh i i had some fun with it and we'll get into it of course and uh but what about you patrick yeah i uh i've seen this quite a few times as and oddly enough as a child um <laughs> i guess i could i uh, i could identify with hob sure in this uh a bit <laughs> i think uh 
think Home Alone came out around this time too. So we had two yeah. children causing massive amounts of violence <laughs> uh, in the year 1990. Uh, yeah, yeah. Not sure how well Hob was received because he was a bit more uh, gritty. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I do remember him distinctly. And um, unfortunately, the robot face of Kane, I also recall quite yeah. vividly. Um, <laughs> there were pieces of it I didn't quite remember that we'll get into at a later uh, a little later in the podcast but um i remember I, like like Zeki was saying i it's not a great movie but it's very watchable and mm. i love bits and pieces and i haven't watched it in probably at least seven years okay and i was like oh yeah i forgot about that it's kind of one of those movies where it's like oh yeah there is something good in there i forgot <laughs> So yeah, that's my history with it. All right, on. Well, let's uh, let's jump into you know actually kind of breaking it down a little bit and and uh, right off the bat, it was nice to see uh, John Glover was in you know cause just like the first movie, this one starts out with a commercial, yeah. um, which isn't immediately apparent, but we have a car thief who's who's breaking into this car and then he gets electrocuted and then like John Glover you know steps in in to the frame from from off camera um i think he's is he even wearing a, a lab coat maybe no, i think he's in a suit okay um but looking very like you know official mm-hmm. and i like him he's from uh you know i know I think, lex yeah lionel luther from or, yeah. smallville um he was jason woodrew who is also known as the Floronic Man in the DC comic universe. He was uh, in uh, Batman and Robin. So What's his name? Uh, the Floronic Man. So he's Floronic? kind of like okay. kind of like Swamp Thing, but not quite oh, as. Oh, okay. Um, but uh, yeah, he was a. <laughs> he's uh, a Swamp Thing deep... villain. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, but, but in, well, and uh, and that Robin. same year he was in Gremlins too, as oh, kind yeah. of kind of the same weaselly suit wearing guy. So. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, the voice of the the Riddler in the Batman the animated series. Yeah. Oh, okay. You know, I think I think the entire series of that's right that original original run. Um, so it was nice seeing him right away, and uh, um, you know, so you go from this commercial where this you know uh, car thief just gets fried and he uh, the you know just like spits the body out on the uh, parking lot, and then the car drives away. Um, I go from that to um, it's uh, Lisa Gibbons. She returns as like the news anchor and they show some more of like um, stuff around the city. This uh, the Surgeon General, they show him getting <laughs> killed, you know, on TV. Yeah. And even when they tell you that the Surgeon General was you know assassinated and then they cut to the, the live footage, like it's still surprising to see it presented, you know, on screen. Um so I like that it it puts you back in that world of the ultra violence and you know they don't censor anything they don't shy away from anything um, and then we get to see like the escalation of kind of things in the next bit where you've got yeah. the old lady like walking across the street and the car hits her uh, the cart that she's pushing and then some guy stops to help but ends up taking her purse and then that guy gets you know beaten up by some some ladies and then some ladies yeah. ladies of the night we'll say yeah yeah <laughs> um it's just yeah, like that was the, brutal the uh, yeah. high heel to the eye <laughs> that's pretty bad <laughs> yeah so i just like the escalation of it oh, like, yeah. ultimately all... it like ends in the it, uh, the gun store robbery and it's like a cartoon yeah it, it just like kept escalating and escalating, and I gotta say, that guy that stole the purse. I mean, he had very low win ratio on that lady's purse. <laughs> I mean, if I was targeting somebody, I wouldn't go for the lady pushing a cart of cans because yeah. it's probably got a purse full of like dead cat heads or something <laughs> in it. Like, I doubt she's got a Rolex and some cash. Yeah, it was it was so. surprising to actually see that she had money in her purse. Yeah. But yeah, I was like, okay, movie, I get it. Things are bad. Jesus, yeah. leave me alone. <laughs> oh, man. But I did like uh, that commercial with the uh, electrocution. Yeah. Because he's like, it doesn't even drain your battery. Oh, yeah. Meanwhile, he's sitting in the stench of a burning corpse and possibly feces after the electrocution. 
like i think there's some downsides to this but yeah you know, whatever <laughs> we'll go with it but yeah i i love the throughout the movie i i love bits and pieces and the commercials were parts yeah. of those I, I don't know why i just do enjoy those because oh, they're yeah. so campy yeah but yeah <laughs> During the uh, the gun store robbery, um, one of the guys, you know, he's he's looking for, I forget what he, what he oh uh, he asked the oh, clerk, the <laughs> you know, he asked the clerk for something, maybe ammo for for that particular gun, yeah. and, he, and the guy tells him, you know, third drawer down or something like that. And what I was really expecting was the guy to open the drawer and have like a shotgun, you know, pa- pointed at, at his face, um, just because that's the kind of escalation you know that I, I was kind of expecting but yeah i thought it was gonna be booby trapped yeah exactly yeah, <laughs> yeah. like shrapnel in his face or something right it does escalate with a rocket launcher though so oh yeah 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 all of it of course building to the reveal you know arrival of of robocop um and one of the big things that i noticed was the absence of the music from the first movie yeah uh, that was that was definitely one of the things i missed throughout this movie just that heroic kind of uh, iconic score that uh, I believe was Basil P- Poldoris from uh, who also did Conan the Barbarian score, which I love. I don't know any other Basils, so yeah, <laughs> Basil Faulty from yeah, Faulty we're Towers. Bring that back, people! Come on. Yeah, you know it's it's interesting because because the score for this one this is by Leonard Rosenman, and um, you know unconsciously I've always sort of associated this movie with. Beneath the Planet of the Apes, uh, tonally, huh. and I think part of those, and I realize only now, is unconsciously, it's because Leonard Rosenman did the music for both. Oh, uh, okay. Huh. Yeah, I would. I never even thought about apes being <laughs> connected to this, but that makes sense if it's the same composer. Hmm. But uh, so we get uh, RoboCop back in business with his uh, fancy suit. Yeah. Is his okay. suit bluer in this movie? Yeah, it okay. is. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I've seen that in a couple of uh, things I've read where it looks a little bit more blue than the grayish yeah. silver in the first one. And I, it, honestly, I kind of like it. It sort of gives off an interesting glow in the light. Yeah. Um, it does throw you off, though, especially when they call it out later when he does get repaired. Mm-hmm. I don't know why, it, it, it looks it looks a little t- it looks a little fiberglassy to me. I yeah. think that's that I find that a little off putting. Yeah, when you I guys get, I think it is because of the restriction of the last suit. Right. Um, yeah. I know Peter Weller had to like not wear pants sometimes like <laughs> yeah. during those shoots, uh, and just shoot them from waist up because it was just such a pain in the butt to walk in. So I could definitely see that being the case. But for whatever reason, I don't mind it. I don't know why. Yeah. And he does such an amazing job of performing in that suit. And um, one of the things I, I noticed, you know, a little bit later when he's been dismantled, you know, and they've got like the puppet version. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. But I think because of the work that Peter Weller is doing uh, leading up to that, like the little robotic twitches that he does, you know, as he's moving around and especially like when you see him after the bit with his wife, when he's back in the precinct and they're kind of, um, having him you know, explain, you know, uh, yeah. what, what are you, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, he does such a good job just, just with his face, you know? Oh yeah. I mean, that's um, a great scene. Yeah. Just, but unfortunately a wasted scene because it sort of <laughs> gets you going into that route and then it just gets abandoned shortly. After. Yeah. But yeah, I totally agree. Like that whole scene was actually reminiscent of the first robocop where it's him struggling to kind of get his identity back but right in this movie i don't really know what happened <laughs> what yeah because the first movie ends with him saying you know who are you uh murphy yeah. you know and then this one yeah pretty quickly they decide like we'll we want to <laughs> remove the the murphy kind of aspect of who he is but and part of that i really like because i i like that the idea in this movie that he's decided to become a cop, you know, that's, that's who he is. He's a cop. He's no longer Murphy. He's, he's a, you know, that's, you know, but I feel like they, they come close to that, uh, making that point in this movie, but they just sort of miss the mark a little bit. And I'll, I'll get into that later with a, with a certain scene, but. Hmm. uh, I mean, the most brutal part of that section is when he's talking to the wife. 
Yeah. And he says that this was built in his honor, like mm. the face part. Yeah. And I was like, oh, cold as hell. <laughs> that right, is right. Bad. <laughs> I love that sequence, but man, that is brutal. Yeah. Like, I assume she just went home and shot herself. <laughs> like, <laughs> did not look well for her. Yeah. It was, it's surprising having a scene where she seems really bothered that he keeps, you know, showing up at her house in her neighborhood. And then the next scene, you know, she would mm -hmm. want to come face to face with him, you know, and have this, like, like she almost wants him to be her husband, you know? Oh yeah. She's got some issues. But the movie, they, they yeah. want, they want the rejection. They want yeah. him to reject her to show that he's, you know, all cop. And, and yeah. it's kind of clear like that, yeah. that it's not what he wants. He, you know, he wishes he could have his old life, but, um, yeah. So uh, my next note is the failure montage. Oh, okay. <laughs> which I thoroughly enjoyed. And yeah. I kind of wish we had a few more prototypes to look at. It was, <laughs> it was just awesome. <laughs> it's just, a, I'd just love to see a whole montage of maybe at least five robots going insane and killing themselves or others around them. Right. In different ways. I just, I don't know. Between that and the commercials, I, I could have just watched a movie of that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was just awesome. You think at a certain point you'd stop giving these machines li live ammunition? <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah like, that is definitely not great. I'd maybe fill it with paint pellets. I yeah, know. you know, rubber bullets maybe. Uh, yeah, paintballs. There you go. Yeah, but um, uh, <laughs> I just love that one with the skull just <laughs> screaming. Like, why? Yeah. But, you know, the next logical step is to get a sociopath and so you know whatever yeah um did the did the old man come across as evil in the first movie no and okay i hated that about this he was like the guy you kind of rooted for at the end of the first okay movie. yeah that's what i thought and now well, it's like well yes and no i mean uh, I, it it's a lot more subtle in the first yeah. one and this I, I would sure i would say ruthless for sure but he didn't come across as the do anything to make the company thrive, you know, sort of, yeah. I don't yeah. care who we kill. I mean, I, I, don't I mean, know, there's, I guess... there's a great moment in the first one that I think really sums up that this guy's kind of a sleazeball, which is right after oh, yeah. Kinney is killed. And I mean, he's <laughs> yeah. just that, been that... shot into hamburger and, and the old okay, man's just yeah. like, yeah. I'm very disappointed. Like that's yeah. messed up, you yeah. know, but I like that. It's, you know, it, it keep, he, they keep his cards close to the chest. And yeah, I definitely think Frank Miller with this one was like, let's just, you know, let's just give him a big old black hat, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's twirling a mustache throughout this film. <laughs> and, like, I don't know. It's just so more obvious in this one. Yeah. Or I kind of liked him better as the uh, silent evildoer of sorts. Like, yeah. Right. That and you had the other guy that was basically. Right. The more evil of the two kind the, of. The guy right. trying to get ahead and. and the, yeah. 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 I mean, you know OCP is not great sure. in the first one, but here it's, like, beaten over your head that, you know, this guy's going to, like, sell his mother to <laughs> do anything. And yeah. Any, yeah, it's just... I don't know. I didn't like his character as much in this movie. Like, yeah. even at the end, that horrible line where he's, like, behaved, I was <laughs> like, what the fuck is that? Yeah. I'm like, I see you're trying to give him an epic line to yell, but that was just freaking lame he sounded like grandpa behave yourself <laughs> yeah that was definitely a surprise in the uh in watching the trailer uh, yeah, that i posted to our, our <laughs> previous movie review you know I've been, uh, like okay that's where we're going with this uh, yeah i mean uh, yeah and to me honestly my favorite villain in this whole movie is the kid hob okay i liked the the i thought he was the best like the lady that will meet uh, Fax, right? Um, the kind of evil doctor lady or uh, psychologist, I think. Yeah, I just didn't understand her. Oh yeah, no, I, I'm not. I, I agree. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, she falls into the same category where it's like yeah. over the top, and but again, I don't, maybe like, I like the kid because it's you know new that it's a kid that's, that's sure. horrible. But and I think that's kind of leads to what I was talking about earlier, where. This this movie does feel like a comic book, you know, because you do have characters who are just evil for evil's sake, whether they display, you know, having the, the 
you know, the motives for yeah. what they're doing. It's just like they're, they're, uh, filling a role. Um, yeah, it's very Dick Tracy. Like when sure. you just watch that. Yeah. And that is a legitimately comic book, comic book. Like, yeah, like that's meant to be, I just wasn't expecting that. I right. think, um, as I got a little older, watch this. Cause when I was a kid, I was just like, I thought it was cool that sure. there were these giant robot fights and stuff. Yeah. Like I enjoyed the, um, uh, action of it, but right later on, I'm like, what? Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of crazy. Especially if you watch the first one and then the second one. Yeah. It's just very jarring. Um, so we, I, I think because I had watched the trailer, uh, you know, a, a week or two before actually sitting down to watch the movie. So I kind of understood that we're going to get a crime Lord type person in, in the, like their mind in the body of a, of a machine. So I think that's, I, I kept wanting to get to that. So like watching this movie, it was so frustrating. Like it felt like it was taking forever to get to stuff like that. You know, um, I mean, I understand that they had to set it up and everything, but I kept waiting for like, okay, yeah. this will be the scene where RoboCop apprehends Kane. You know, it's like that didn't happen. You know, I, I expected that when when he goes to the arcade and he sees the kid and uh, the the dirty cop and you know, stuff like that. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, did you think of Ninja Turtles when you saw the arcade? A little <laughs> bit. I I totally did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Kind of um, waiting. For the uh, Ninja Turtle battle rap song to commence or something. <laughs> yeah, um, the, the I thought it was interesting the you know the the scene where RoboCop busts the uh, the arcade and he takes uh, Officer Duffy, mm -hmm. you know, and kind of gets some information from him. And then I thought it was weird that RoboCop then like leaves, goes on his own. Like, well, I mean, they're all on strike and well, but Lewis is or Lewis his, is busy with other stuff. Well, she's there and fighting with Hob and I think maybe another guy, but like she's having a hard yeah. enough time, you know, fighting a kid, <laughs> which yeah. was odd to see. But it also like, why are you having so much problem? So <laughs> it's like a little monkey just clinging to her back with a choking cord. I guess. Well, plus she's probably pulling her punches, right? She doesn't want to hurt him. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. But, I, I mean, I could see that, but I thought she was chasing after them still. Hmm. While Murphy was beating that guy into the arcade machines, but right, I don't know. It was it was weird because Murphy was there and wasn't there. She was like a ghost in this movie. Oh, Lewis, yeah, he, or Lois, yeah. Lois, yeah. <laughs> Keep yeah. saying Lois, but <laughs> and and that's a know. shame. That's that a was... shame. She, you know, she she yeah. uh, Nancy Allen signed on uh, based on a version of the script that gave Lewis a lot more to do, and they just oh, okay. ch chopped her part to pieces, which is really unfortunate. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't know. I didn't feel like she was his partner in this movie. Yeah, right. Yeah, like, and so that's kind of is what felt weird when you see him like in the next scene going to this. Uh, I think they even call it the sludge plant. That's what Duffy gives him the information of where to find Kane. I think yeah. or where the drugs are being made, and that's what you know. So like, he goes is that there. Where the last movie ended with the bad guys. That's what I wondered. <laughs> was, I wondered if this but was, that was the same more toxic location. Waste, I think. Yeah. Well, I I heard that. I may have them switch, but one was in Houston and one might have been in Dallas. Okay. Like, they're Texas-based locations for mm. both movies, but I know they are different cities. Okay. Um, yeah, I know. It felt uh, like... It, I, I think the way they... Like, with the establishing shots and just the, the tone and the way that RoboCop reacted when he got there, it felt like it was meant to be him revisiting the place where he was killed, yeah, you know? They mm. gave that vibe. Yeah. But I didn't think it was weird that he went alone. You know, seeing him drive up, I kept thinking, well, Lewis must be with him. But, you know, he gets out and goes in by himself. And, and that just felt strange to me. Uh, yeah. I remember thinking he just drove into that landmine and survived. Because basically, <laughs> at the beginning of the movie, he survived a similar explosion in the car. Right. Yeah. But then he was gone. I was like, <laughs> did he, like, catapult up like a cartoon up onto a building or something? <laughs> I didn't realize he... Never got in. Right. The bad Set the car to see him because of that weird view he had. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, it, it is kind of strange because they, they do set up that, uh, giving him like the element of surprise, you know, letting the car get exploded while he stands behind a shed. And then 
you know, but then as he like then sneaks into the building, they can hear him a mile away. It's like everyone is ready yeah. for him once he's in there. So it's kind of like, why, you know, it, it would kind of, I guess, look cool to have him seemingly be exploded and then shot all the hell and then not be in the car. But it, it ultimately doesn't do anything. Yeah, that henchman look like, oh, I guess we got him. Yeah. <laughs> like he just shrugged. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, um, my note here is that, um, Kane's a huge Elvis fan. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I like the pictures of like Jesus and then Elvis and then um, it, it escalates again where it goes to uh, Elvis's corpse and, uh, <laughs> he's still decked out. I'll give Elvis some credit there. Sure. Still looking good. Yeah. Yeah. But I thought that was a weird thing to throw in there. <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, I didn't, I don't know if that, like it doesn't play like he doesn't like act like Elvis. Right. Like I don't, <laughs> It's just a weird item to just toss in there. Right yeah. Away. But <laughs> everything about this movie is a little odd. So sure. Who knows? Yeah. Um, oh, I meant to ask, um, who are your guys' like, favorite bad guy in this movie? I know I said mine was the kid, but I'm just curious as to what everyone else's favorite. Well, honestly, like, whatever. you know, we meet Kane kind of in this scene, and I was kind of unimpressed with him. Yeah. Um, I didn't really like Kane that much in, in the movie. Um, I, I, yeah, I think it's for me, it's going to be the uh, facts, the psychologist. Jump cut to Zachy saying it's uh, Kane. Right. <laughs> no, I, I, I would agree. <laughs> I would agree it's the kid, to be honest. I And, and okay. n- not because, I mean, he doesn't get fleshed out a ton, but I mean, I agree that Kane is not as dynamic. I, I think the problem really is that the first film had such an amazing coterie of villains, right? I mean, you had yeah. mm-hmm. uh, Clarence Boddicker is like one of the all-time great movie bad... I mean, you like you can't wait to see this guy get his comeuppance, you know? Yeah. Uh, same with Dick Jones. And I think I think Kane, Tom Noonan, he's doing something kind of interesting. Uh, he's in his head. Uh, I just don't think that's what this movie was asking for. Uh, which is unfortunate. Yeah. I, I just and by the way, I, I happened to look up Belinda Bauer, who plays Doctor Fax, mm. and she retired from acting and is in fact a psychologist now. So, oh wow, that's a <laughs> weird piece of trivia right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> did she right. retire uh, soon after this movie, or uh, was it a couple of years? I think her last okay. credit is like ninety six. Okay, yeah. Hmm. Um, I think for me with uh, with Kane, it was like. You know, towards the end of it, his his last scene before he's you know actually taken out is, um, we 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 see that he wants to take his drugs mainstream. You know, he wants everyone, the rich and the poor, to be using. Um, but then there's yeah. no like indication that he has the means to do any of this. It's not until like Hob is on his own that he attempts to buy the mayor and succeeds. You know, <laughs> like. It's like you almost need that. I feel like Kane doesn't have like a a good plan in place, whereas Hob does. But yeah. I don't know that Hob has the the drugs anymore. You know, so yeah, I don't know they, what Hob has to. I know. assume they have multiple production facilities. Maybe you know one got ruined where RoboCop came in and broke up the yeah uh, slave esque production yeah. facility with the little baby. Sure. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, you got this trailer with uh, Frank Miller peddling the drugs there. Yeah. Um, where they're, I think they're a bit more sophisticated than they let on because even Kane says that there's now drugs for each kind of mood. Yeah. That yeah. you can control. And I just don't think it's flushed out as to how big of an operation they have. Mm-hmm. They minimize it by saying, you know, instead of going local, we'll go, you know, more nationwide. Yeah. But, I mean, Detroit's a pretty big area, so they probably have quite a few facilities, and obviously they have the demand Yeah, <laughs> based it, on the crimes being committed to get the money to get the nuke. I think it just, towards you know the middle of the movie, it just felt like between Hobb and Kane, they both had like half of a plan. <laughs> sure. You know? Yeah. So, but they it it never came together. It wasn't. I don't know. It. I feel like Hob has it more together. A little uh, bit. Kane yeah. is more David Koresh, God complex yeah. cult leader. Yeah. And Hobbs is the more uh, networking 
doesn't do More the gangster. drugs. Yeah. And like I felt like Hobbs was still in control even with that horrific scene with the the cops punishment. Oh <laughs> yeah. Um that was the only time I saw Hobbs not really in control. Mm. But for the most part, I think Hobbs was the brains of the operation, unfortunately. Mm. Like I think he knew how to expand, whereas Kane knew how to uh, pedal. Like I felt like Kane was just like a drug dealer. Yeah. That unfortunately got hooked on his own stuff. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it it that's part of the reason why this movie isn't as good is because the villain is sporadically sprinkled throughout <laughs> different characters. Yeah, I think you have, I guess these two or three villains who are all yeah. just a little bit watered down instead of having yeah. kind of more like one really strong. Cause I think you could have, I mean, there's four villains. There's the sure. head of OCP, the scientist, the yeah. uh, Kane and Hobbs. I, I mean, you have that many bad guys sharing what yeah. should be one role. Uh, yeah. I think you could roll maybe. Kane and Hobb into one character, Yeah, you know, because I think having have a scene where Kane buys the mayor to get his drugs into the city a little bit easier or have the mayor be hooked on nuke and a little bit more willing to to be bought. I think yeah, he should have done that earlier. Right. Before, like, yeah, like, that scene. Listen to Hobbs, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I did like throughout this movie, I think I just kept rewriting it in my head and, and moving scenes around and things like that and 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 that was part of the frustrating thing about this movie was just feeling like they had a lot of good ideas. They just needed maybe one more, one more draft. Maybe, um, you know, I don't know how many drafts there were of this, of the script and all that, but, um, I, I just realized I keep saying Hobbs because of yeah. freaking Hobbs and Shaw, which <laughs> sure. fast and the furious. It's yeah. just Hob. Hob. Yeah. That's uh, going to be a pain in the butt. Yeah. I'd say. Okay. <laughs> um, jumping back a little bit, just, we, we, you know, the scene where they do dismantle RoboCop is oh, is pretty yeah. great, um, and then of course dumping his uh, pieces and parts off at the uh, precinct was also pretty cool. Um, and then going back to what I was saying about having uh, Peter Weller doing such a great job beforehand of of behaving like a robot, I think yeah. goes a long way to making this uh, Murphy RoboCop puppet really work because you know i mean you can tell now you obviously you can tell that it's a puppet um but it's very i think it's very believable you know because it essentially is exactly what you know by with by them making an animatronic puppet that's how you would build robocop you know it just it's just missing the human you know brain and all that of course but yeah um so i think that's why it, part, part of why it works really well Seeing him like hanging from the uh, the chains, I thought was really mm -hmm. cool. Just I really yeah. dug. It gave me many nightmares. I yeah. shouldn't have watched this movie when I did. <laughs> yeah, with his eyes rolling back and like yeah. the noise of like <laughs> like mm -hmm. it was just yeah, it's an awesome job. Both yeah, you know from a technical and acting standpoint to make that work. Yeah, and I noticed Rob Botin. Uh, I noticed his name in the credits, uh, and he was the you know one of the brilliant people in uh, the thing who brought us a lot of the, you know, monsters and, and various creatures in, in the thing that worked so well. So I wasn't surprised to see his name in the credits here. So um, my uh, runner up for uh, next bad guy is the lawyer at OCP. Oh yeah. Just yeah. because of the scene where they're trying to put him back together. <laughs> he's just a total, I wouldn't say he's a bad guy. He's the, uh, peck of this movie that, yeah um, yeah that he's a slimy, slimy lawyer yeah yeah and he does a great job yeah i loved him throughout the movie he's just like you're lucky i'm even talking to you <laughs> <laughs> and then like i mean throughout he's just perfect as like the worst lawyer you could ever imagine yeah <laughs> stereotypical sleazeball just uh, i loved him he's my second favorite character in the movie i think <laughs> right on. there's we we get the scene with uh dr fax and she's talking about how you know the the reason that all their attempts at making robocop 2 are failing is because you know they don't have the right candidate who wants to be you know they're basically because the people the the minds are rebelling against the the 
being a machine, that sort of thing. So she yeah. wants to find people who will volunteer. And there's a scene with her, and I think uh, Johnson, who returns from the first movie. Yeah. And they're discussing, or <clears throat> like in the background, you can see on a TV screen, it's it's flipping through, uh, you know, various inmates, and you know that's mm-hmm. where we she reveals that she wants to use a criminal to to do this, someone who's already kind of a, a broken person, anyways. Um, but I really liked uh, the names of all these inmates that are are. Uh, filtering through the screen are all comic book artists and uh, maybe a few writers. So there's Steve Gerber who created uh, he created Man Thing and Howard the Duck. Uh, Will Eisner who created uh, the Spirit. Someone called uh, Spain Rodriguez who I'm, I'm unfamiliar with. Uh, there was one inmate uh, named uh, Lieber which could be could be a reference to. Stan Lee, whose real name was Stan Lieber, or his brother Larry Lieber, who was also involved in comics. There, there were a bunch of these, and, and uh, seeing uh, Gibbons and Moore, which refer to Dave Gibbons and Alan Moore, who, you know, one of their ma- major, cre- uh, you know, creations were uh, the Watchmen, which I'm, I'm definitely familiar with. Um, so several other names in, in that bunch of. Uh, uh, sociopaths and and stuff so it was kind of fun so to... some frank miller easter eggs um I yeah assume. and uh, uh which one was it um one of the photos was actually somebody i can't remember now who it was yeah i still don't really understand her plan with the uh psychopath brains being a good idea yeah i mean she kind of alludes to kane being perfect because he's addicted to something which means obedience if she can use that addiction against him. But. When she knows that someone like that will desire immortality and that this is kind of a form of uh, putting your mind in a machine like this is, is a way to live forever. So she knows that she can appeal to someone like that with this. But that's um, a weird form of immortality. Though. Yeah. <laughs> like you're still grappling with the uh, fact that you're a machine now and the fact that this lady with a remote control can dictate what you do yeah like i don't think uh and and, and it you know pans out that you know that's not the case with Kane. <laughs> yeah like, you don't want to be controlled and i don't know why she would think a person like him would want to be the, well, the only the... the only thing i can think of is that this is frank miller's sort of critique of the psychotherapy industry which is really in vogue at that yeah. time and and you know yeah. what knowing what we know about frank miller and his sort of very black and white view of the world i can i can see him sort of wanting to poke holes in the notion the sort of wishy-washy bleeding heart idea that a bad person can be you know reformed Sure. Yeah. yeah. But obviously, I, in it's execution, just... it kind of falls apart. But I, I would assume yeah. that there's something of that there. You know. Well, I, I think the the whole idea of this, I, I like the idea of it on one hand, um, but I, I, it's odd because she's more concerned with making a good cyborg, and not making a cyborg who is has any interest in upholding the law. <laughs> right. You know, it's like. She, with her wanting to, she just wants to make it work and prove that she can do it regardless of what they want that cyborg to go out and do. Like, you know, it's a, it's a bad foundation for what you ultimately want to accomplish, which I know OCP just wants to make money and, you know, they're less concerned with, I guess, you know, law and protection and and that sort of thing. Um, I think the, for me, the, the, where this falls apart, is she talks all about, you know, we need someone who will volunteer. And <laughs> yeah. leading up to that, I get, okay, perfect. Kane is is the sort of person who is going to want, you know, to, to live forever um, in, in this sort of way. And especially they, they set it up perfectly where, you know, eventually they, you know, Robocop kind of rallies the troops and they go and raid uh, Kane's factory and, you know, Ultimately, it ends with a, a game of chicken between Robocop and Kane. And then, you know, next time we see Kane, he's in the hospital and he's near near death or, you know, not really because she just wants, you know, wants to use him. So she basically uh, 
kills him. And uh, as he's like dying or, you know, as he's losing his life, he then starts to panic and, and you, know, you can see that he does not want to die. And so I think ultimately, like, like immediately, then that goes against what you're trying to do. He's no longer a volunteer. So yeah. I think the way to do it would have been, you know, make him completely paralyzed from his interaction with RoboCop. You know, someone who mm -hmm. is, you know, in a maybe a full body cast or they tell him you're never going to you're, you're just your mind is trapped in your body. You'll never move again. You'll never be able to do you know whatever you want to do. So I can take your mind and put it into an unstoppable killing machine. You know, it, <laughs> I think they needed to do that and give him make it his choice and make it something that he yeah. wants. Because the instant that she, you know, decides she's going to harvest his body and he starts to freak out, that completely, you know, goes against what what they're trying to set up with, with this, you know, Kane, you know, robot and all that stuff. So I, I just thought that was odd. Yeah, her, her plans are a bit bizarre. Um, yeah. I don't know what you guys thought. Um, I mean, personally, I thoroughly enjoyed this, but I don't quite understand her thinking with the reprogramming of RoboCop. Yeah. Was that she was... trying to sabotage RoboCop or was she legit thinking that this was a better version? <laughs> I, I couldn't tell. Yeah. That was a weird scene. <laughs> like he turns into a weird lovey dovey RoboCop and he's got all those millions of different uh, directives now yeah. breaking his mind, which I thought was kind of cool uh, that the part where he like, hears that the only way to do it is to overload his system. Sure. And he just runs out to the conveniently placed uh, power source. Yeah. Uh, and electrocutes himself. But um, I, I didn't know if she was trying to purposely screw up RoboCop or if she thought she was, if that's what she really thought RoboCop should be. Right. Like, I just couldn't tell throughout yeah. the movie. No, I, I don't know either. Yeah. I don't think the movie um, knows. I, right. I think in a typical <laughs> story you know uh you you'd have her reprogram him to do this and then have the city turn on him you know and and make him out to be a bad guy and completely have everyone lose faith in him and then that's why her the next model is what you know people are are wa wanting now but yeah it doesn't really do that it just you know it makes it, a joke out of the whole thing right and and then so. what i thought was the odd thing was that he hears them talking about, well, how do we fix Ro Ro RoboCop? And yeah, we, he needs to overload his circuits. And But the idea of him then taking the initiative to go out and mm -hmm. electrocute himself, I never got the sense that he was at war within himself. You know, he was initially I, at the beginning with um, Dr. Fax. Yeah. Know, she was yeah. biting him. But, but yeah. But once he's he repro reprogrammed, he never seems like mm -hmm. he knows that like, he he's trying to get out of it. You know, it, it just feels like, like it should have been someone else. Maybe that like, maybe just Lewis, you know, just electrocutes him or they were trying to establish this, this um, other doctor who like, she was kind of his caretaker within the police precinct, you know, maybe make, have her make the decision to electrocute him, but they don't do yeah. that. They, you know, he just decides that he needs to fix himself, even though I didn't get the sense that he felt that there was a problem, you know? Yeah. Although I got to say, I did enjoy him reading the Miranda rights to the dead guy with the bullet and stuff. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, it makes me laugh every time. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. <laughs> um, cheap laugh. Yeah. I, and again, like rewriting this movie and, and moving things around, I think him electrocuting himself and bringing himself back should have been the bridge between acts two and three. Cause that should be like the big heroic moment of, okay, Roo cop has returned, but it's like, this happens before they even arrest Kane. So it was again, it's like, yeah, let's get this stuff going. Like it feels like it takes forever to get Kane arrested and in, in, in the place to, to be turned into a robot. Like, um, and, and one thing I was really disappointed with, um, when RoboCop returns, you know, when he electrocutes himself and we've got all the, the other cops who are on strike, you know, 
they all again they they get close to the mark, but then they don't really, you know, I don't think they really achieve what what they're trying to do. You know, when RoboCop comes back and um he asks all the the striking police officers like are are we not cops or something like that you know yeah. it, it's it's almost trying to to be a rousing speech to inspire <laughs> yeah. all the other cops um and what i really like is that he's you see his directives are like blank you know he no longer has mm-hmm. all the millions of of directives and i don't think he even has the 3 that he initially no. starts with yeah. um the the one directive should be uphold the law and that's what he should then tell all the cops you know what are what are we here to do we're here to uphold the law and i think it, it just it just misses that mark for me and and i was really hoping for some sort of you know scene with him him you know being the cyborg inspires all the other cops to be cops and then that's what i think should be the the message of the movie but yeah it makes it imply that he is murphy still right and murphy himself has those directives he doesn't need them and it brings him back to being human again (laughs) yeah i don't know it's very confusing but yeah yeah. (laughs) if there's no directives does he just go insane and start (laughs) killing whoever i mean it, it sort of lets you make the or connect the dots that well he has no directives and he's still this person in a sense yeah um so yeah it it has a lot of conflict throughout the movie as to what he is yeah (laughs) and it sort of ends with well he's murphy (laughs) well and i i mean i think i think the 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 implication is that and this goes back to you know the first film where what we know about Alex Murphy from before he became RoboCop is he was a good cop and, and he doesn't need to be programmed to be a good cop. And so he's lost his wife. He's lost, he's lost everything that made him human, but that sense of, you know, what are the prime directives, right? Preserve the, you know, public trust, uphold the law, et cetera, et cetera. Right. That, that's, that's just who Alex Murphy is, whether or not he's a robot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think they even mention it. Um, Dr. Fax says that he was, you know, uh, devout Catholic and family man and the high sense of duty that let him not go insane. Yeah. Which huh, he's got to be the most strong willed <laughs> being ever. Cause whew, yeah, yeah. That was a rough, uh, rough few years for that guy. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we have the mayor of Detroit. that seems like kind of explains why Detroit's in its current state. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of like the mayor character, but he, he seems like an idiot. Well, I like that he seems so young because Mm -hmm. it's probably really hard to find someone who wants to be the mayor of Detroit. So I think you get someone who's young and inexperienced and that's why he's like so bad at his job. And, but he's, he's trying to be a good person and he's, you know, he tries to, he wants to be the, he doesn't just want to be someone who, uh, just got handed the the office because it's just a you know inconsequential like yeah. role he's, like you know he's idealistic yeah but doesn't know how to get those ideas yeah to where he thinks they should be yeah and it's hilarious when he's trying to talk with the kid right Bob. and he's like oh yeah he's got a good point <laughs> like <laughs> yeah. no he doesn't <laughs> dude what the... you just want that money because the banjo yeah. crotch guy didn't work out for you yeah or the violin crotch guy. Oh yeah, doing, yeah, the like, telethon, the fundraiser. Yeah, that's <laughs> awesome. Yeah, uh, although they spent way too much time on that guy. Mm, um, yeah, I could have done with at least like two minutes less of that. But <laughs> sure, I, I really like the idea um, where you know they they do have this telethon pledge drive thing, and that's when they 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 use that opportunity. Um, <laughs> To make like to play to make a phone call and and list demands. Like I really like the idea of a uh, a ransom call during a pledge drive. Um, yeah, that was and then you know they show like the total, but it's like four thousand dollars yeah, or something yeah. <laughs> out of like yeah. thirty five million. Mm. Yeah, I thought that was well done, kind of funny. Yeah, but yeah. So um, I know uh, the lawyer of the city sort of rats out what the mayor's up to with the whole. Somebody's going to bail out the city and screw over OCP thing. Yeah. Um, 
and then you know uh, the doc sends Kane in to clean up that mess. Sure, but um, <laughs> it just seemed everything seemed so rushed mm-hmm. as soon as he got into the machine. Yeah, that I, I don't know. This movie just paced really weird. Like it took forever to get Kane into it. Yeah, and then boom, we're off. Right, and all hell's breaking loose. Like I don't know. The pacing was just whacked out after act two sure and that's why it seems weird to to establish hob as his own um crime boss because it 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 works for one scene and then kane kills everybody so that it goes nowhere you know um that's part of why i it was so it felt so unnecessary and and just um yeah they're so 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 many little things in this movie, I think that they they spend too much time establishing that that essentially go nowhere, you know. Yeah. Because even the scene with re- reprogramming RoboCop, it takes about you know five minutes of the movie, but it it, <laughs> yep. it 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 does nothing, you know. It gives you that comedy montage. Yeah. Of being a yeah. Boy Scout for right. Ten minutes. Right. That's um, about it. Yeah. No, I I think uh, another fundamental problem, in my opinion, is that Kane basically stops being a character like halfway through the movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And, and I think, I think what they really needed was they needed a better synergy of, of the, the robotic body and still have, I mean, you know, like Robocop is still Peter Weller, you know, but Tom Noonan is basically is gone. And, and then he's just, he's just another Ed 209. Yeah. 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 He's basically a drug addicted robot. Yeah. At this point, that's the only piece that remains is his addiction. You get a little bit of it when he's um, looking at the uh, lady. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, and like Angie, I think. But that, yeah, that escalates to a level I forgot about. Sure, but <laughs> yeah, like that's about it as far as Kane's character. It's yeah, recognizing her and uh, Nuke, and that's all he is. Yeah, I like the idea of a robot mm-hmm. that that actually is addicted to drugs. Um, <laughs> But yeah, there's nothing special about Kane once he's once he's a robot. Like I, I, I even wrote down in my notes too that he just it's it is just Ed two oh nine, and it, it feels weird. Like even just the, the visuals of this Kane robot, it feels like an Ed two oh nine without the kind of armor shell, you know, because uh-huh. it, it seems lots of uh, exposed you know gears and and yeah. he he seems more vulnerable than an ed 209 even like i don't know why at least can take stairs though yeah yeah that. but uh yeah he did, i think what also hurts is he doesn't really talk yeah he, i think you know, what makes noise but yeah. i think what they should have done instead of you know the cgi face <laughs> is have like a video monitor face and yeah. have actual cane you know because i think you could explain it the same way they do like in the matrix where you your brain or your mind sees itself as you want to be and so i could buy that this you know complex machine could then present kane as he wants to be so you could have kane just on a video monitor talking and and being himself and maybe being a little bit of a of a crazy character, you know, instead of this CGI limit, very limited CGI face that I don't think they could do much more than make him growl, you know? Yeah. Cause well, it's nine, 1990. The graphics cards just aren't there. Yet. Well, and that's why they <laughs> shouldn't have done it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know? it, it just made me think of lawnmower man the whole time. Sure. <laughs> like that weird. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, it's off putting. Yeah. <laughs> And part of that may it may have been cooler at the time. I honestly can't remember, but now it just looks it's just awful. Yeah. Um, one genuine surprise that I had in this area, uh, you we see Hob climbing the armored truck, and mm-hmm. then uh, Kane like shoots up the truck, and then it you know switches to RoboCop, and he's kind of coming upon this this whole area and and witnessing the destruction and Kane is, is I guess long, long gone. And yeah. then RoboCop finds Hob as he's dying. And that really surprised me. Um, one, because I <laughs> yeah. didn't, they didn't, you know, I, I didn't realize that when Hob shot the truck that he actually shot through the truck, I thought they were setting up that Hob, you know, 
would would live or would get away or maybe be taken hostage by Kane. So I was really surprised when they when RoboCop opens the doors and finds that Hob has been shot and gets a little death scene, which you know I think the death scene for Hob was really good. Like, yeah, between the two of them, so. It's like it's you know how it is to die. Yeah, it yeah. sucks. <laughs> then he's just dead. Yeah. <laughs> Although I will give the movie credit for not making a miniature version of Kane's robot and putting Hob in it. There you go. That, that'd be fun. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe a little uh, little side robot that can like yeah. you can ride him and then you know you can shoot him off and then you know yeah. It's just like a piece of his armor. Yeah. He shoots off Hob into. Oh, that'd be fun. <laughs> to get into smaller locations. Right. <laughs> little assassin droid. Sort of thing. All right, RoboCop four or five, <laughs> wherever they left off, we're coming at you. Yeah, Hobbs back and he's better than ever. That's right. <laughs> we'll make Hobb and Kane. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, this movie is just so bizarre. Yeah, like I love it in pieces, but as a whole, it's just woof. Yeah, yeah. It, like when you sit and think about it, it's rough. But if you just sit and watch, not so bad. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's the problem I have with this podcast. It makes me <laughs> stop and think, and it's ruined a couple movies for me. And I'll never forgive you, Travis. Yeah. Uh, when I die, I'm going to be like, this sucks, and Travis. <laughs> damn you. That's going to be my dying words. I'm going to hold you to that. Yep. But like, you ruined Spaceballs for me. Well, <laughs> Spaceballs ruined Spaceballs. How dare you, sir? <laughs> it still holds up. So the kind of the next... I guess the transition, I think this would take us into act three, but it's when, uh, the old man, you know, it, it's kind of him unveiling this big, uh, OCP flag and their new, uh, like com- tower. community center. Yeah. Like whatever, like, and, and this kind of yeah. comes out of nowhere. It feels like, <laughs> it does. um, but you it's, you know, they want the city, but you don't know what their plans are yeah. and all of a sudden it's a mega tower city that he wants to build. That yeah. It's really, it, everyone. It's really hard to overlook the fact that OCP unveils this new, you know, red, black and white flag. And you've got this businessman who's saying he's going to make uh Detroit great again. Like it, it, <laughs> I know. in, in today's world, it's really hard not to see some uh, scary oh, yeah. similarities to, uh, yeah, I mean, we have Trump and his towers. Yeah, we have we have the slogan. It's a guy that's in his seventies. Uh, <laughs> it's very Nazi esque, you know, flag for OCP. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Um. So let's see. We have uh. Yeah, we have the old man, and he's given this speech, and has the the giant miniature city that rises up from the floor which i can also always appreciate you know the yeah that sort of thing and yeah. very bond villain very I bond villain it. yeah very comic book <laughs> uh, and then robocop 2 coming out of that as well yeah yeah it's like ah huh, he must have a giant like uh park in the middle for him to come out of or mm-hmm. something i don't know what happened there it's just a vacant spot in his giant new city yeah but uh yeah things escalate quickly as usual sure uh, I I found that the you know once RoboCop arrives and it's it's him versus Kane it just felt like I was watching Robot Chicken with their action because <laughs> you know, it yeah. just felt like action figures fighting yeah. you know yeah because a lot of it you know was definitely uh, stop motion you know just using yeah. uh, essentially using action figures to to it's do it's fine in small doses yes. but yeah when it's an entire action sequence yeah. it is really messed up yeah and i still don't understand the doctor again saying that he's obsolete when he's trying to stop the thing she created from destroying right yeah like you'd be like well well, what's your plan then right (laughs) like he just crushed your remote control so (laughs) mm, i'd be on robocop side yeah the og version um one thing i think is really nice is that the cops aren't against robocop this go around like in <laughs> yeah. a scene where it breaks out into the streets it's not all the cops aren't shooting at robocop they're all um it's like everybody is against uh kane and i actually do really like the sequence where kane is just unstoppable and you know taking out all the cops and all the vehicles and all that stuff that's it's that scene i think works really well um 
Well, they know him now yeah, as Murphy yeah. more. Yeah. So, I mean, it makes sense. And the, yeah. I mean, it's insane how indestructible Kane is. Yeah. But, uh, especially when uh, Lewis uh, drove the uh, mm. car, the armored car into him. Right. Like, I'm like, okay, not even a scratch. All right. This yeah. Be interesting. <laughs> After he fell off a building from mm-hmm. like the hundred stories, yeah. but yeah, the whole thing was just bizarre. I felt like I was just watching claymation fights. Yeah. yeah. Like you were saying, it's. I mean, I kind of got it, but then we had fucking Bronco Robocop <laughs> on top of him, and I'm like, yeah. I can't back out. <laughs> Why is he making Lewis give the drugs to? Like, I don't know. Yeah, I think I kept expecting because they, they realized that. What, what you know the thing he wants is the nuke so i th- think i just I, I expected them to have somehow done like a bait and switch of of giving like him the nuke but giving him the nuke but it's really like battery acid yeah. or you know some sort yeah. of like he's gonna put this inside of his you know his core and it's gonna eat it eat away at him from the inside or do um, the old superman three maneuver well, checked yeah, yeah yeah well he checked it i mean he opened sure. the canister at least and looked that it was, you know, that red. That's true. Yeah. They didn't have enough time to, you know, yeah, yeah. paint it or something. So yeah. I, I let that go. I would have liked that too, but yeah, at least it wasn't like stupidity where he just throws it in while it's in the case. Right. Um, um, but I do kind of wonder how it works with him now that he doesn't have a body. Like, is it just neurological like fix at this yeah, point? Yeah, no. Well, I guess it's it's because he does have that brain stem. Yeah. And he's got the spinal column. Like that's what it's feeding. It's feeding that brain, yeah. the brain, which I do like that he's got a the brain. You know, brain chemistry, all that stuff. Factor. You know, yeah. yeah. Um, Although, wouldn't it be awesome if he had like a directive to not do drugs and to see how that <laughs> unfolded? <laughs> drugs are bad. Right. What blow up? Yeah. <laughs> Because she can program it to an extent. Yeah. Hmm. But um, I think the the last note I have is my favorite part of the movie. Okay. Where um, he uh, basically is talking to his lawyer and uh, the, uh, I'm blanking on his name, the other guy. Um, Johnson? From the first movie. Johnson, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I want to say Jackson. Johnson. And uh, they're like, well, we could just blame it on the doctor. Yeah. <laughs> What's... Uh, go ahead and uh, do what we discussed earlier, and then he walks out with her. <laughs> yeah. And then as they're walking, he just steps over a lady's corpse. <laughs> yeah. And then goes into his limo. I just, I don't know why I love that part. Mm-hmm. Like, he's just so above the law. He'll sure. just step over a dying person or a dead person mm-hmm. and just enjoy his limo ride. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It just made me laugh. I loved it. <laughs> yeah. No, I do like that OCP gets to remain like the ever present evil corporation that can't be taken down. Like, yeah. Yeah. He's like, well, get the PR guys on this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, yeah. That's all he says. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, I don't know, it's just funny. <laughs> I, I kind of pictured like, uh, what's his face? Uh, Bezos. Like Amazon oh. as a <laughs> comparable, like large entity, just doing the same thing. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just like, yeah, Amazon could get away with that. Yeah, I mean, you ain't wrong. Like free yeah. shipping, next day delivery yeah. for like a year. Everyone oh, gets okay. Amazon Prime. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, they're they're already doing like drone delivery and all that shit, right? Yeah, so like, yeah. we're not that far removed from RoboCop uh, too. <laughs> oh jeez, man, that's not good. Oh, that's not good at all. Yeah. Well, I'm going to lean on uh, Zachy here to uh, keep the in- uh, artificial intelligence in check since he's the closest to it. Yeah, uh, I'll, uh, I'll, with, I'll do uh, what Google I can. over there. Uh, so I'm going to need your help on that. <laughs> I assume it's going to come out of California. Pro- of probably, area. yeah. One presumes. That's where we're going to get the either the Terminator or RoboCop, or, or I should say RoboCop 2 is coming out of that area. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think it's coming from Detroit yet, but... <laughs> Well, they are getting that statue pretty soon, I think. I think they're almost complete with that RoboCop <laughs> statue. Oh, I thought they already had that. I, That's I, awesome. I think I just saw something a couple of days ago about like it's almost done or something like that. Or they. I've probably just seen the story for so long yeah, that yeah. I thought it was already out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's get a statue of basically a movie saying our city's a horrible cesspool. <laughs> Good call. Right. Um, I mean, I think that's RoboCop 2. Uh, any final <laughs> thoughts on... That's the perfect way to end it. I think it's RoboCop 2. 
Yeah. <sighs> Any notes that uh, you didn't get to hit, Zachy? Uh, no, I mean, I'll I'll just reiterate what I said earlier. I mean, it it is by no means good, but I think <laughs> a movie being fascinatingly bad is sometimes just as good. Mm. Uh, in terms of at least fostering an interesting discussion and saying, I wonder what they were going for with this, you know? And, and the reason I, I, I say that is because Irvin Kirshner's no dummy. Frank Miller's no dummy. Yeah. And this was, this was made by people who know their way around a story. And so sure. clearly there were intentions that didn't necessarily uh, meet in terms of execution, but that doesn't mean those intentions aren't worth analyzing. Yeah. I, I think it just got trapped and like, is it an action movie? Is it a study in like artificial, quasi artificial intelligence? Like, yeah, I, like it didn't have that character development with Robocop we had in the first one. It was more action oriented. Well, and um, I think the first movie had a nice balance of being an action it, movie it that made yeah. you think. Because who's the was the director of this one? Didn't he do Star Wars? He did. Oh, Empire. The Empire Strikes Back. Empire. Yeah. yeah. So. And that one was more character driven than sure. action, I would say. And I wonder if that's part of it that the director's dealing in a world that he's not as not necessarily good with, but more, sure. he's more comfortable with more character driven kind of action than yeah. action action. <laughs> that could be. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know because I, I when I was looking at, it, I knew he did a star. I couldn't remember the life of me, which star Wars, but I knew he did a star Wars one that was highly regarded. Yeah. <laughs> and I was kind of surprised that Robocop two fell into what it fell into. Sure. Um, and I don't know if maybe it was too many cooks in the kitchen kind of thing, um, with the story, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's got pieces that I love, Yeah. but yeah, as a whole, it's just kind of rough to mm-hmm. think about. I'll just watch it and enjoy it. Yeah. From now on. This viewing hurt me. <laughs> I'm so. sorry. This uh, I'm sorry. This podcast has, has ruined your <laughs> your love of, <laughs> of these movies. <laughs> um, no, I luckily I'm like a goldfish. I'll forget about okay, it good. in a few minutes and good. enjoy it once more. Um, and and I realized, you know, once we started talking about Irvin Kirshner, um, he earlier when they had the uh, rotating headshots of uh, the, all the sociopaths that were mostly comic book artists. At least the names were not necessarily the photos, but that is where Irvin Kirshner gets his cameo. He's one of the, he's not named, but he is one of the inmates or sociopaths that are. Oh, okay. So that's, I was trying to, I know earlier I was talking about someone was on screen as, as, yeah, but I couldn't remember who, but it was Kirshner. So it <laughs> was the director. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Um, okay. so, why don't we go through our most villainous and most heroic uh, moments or, or characters or... This planet, these people, they are nothing to me. You were made to be ruled. The universe is power! You unstoppable power! Come to me, son of jor Kneel before Zod! I am that force! I am that power! In the end, you will always kneel. Kneel before your master! I can go. Okay. Um, I'm going to say, uh, that's probably the obvious one, but Kane uh, cutting open the cop and making Hob watch. Oh, that's pretty that good, was, yeah. That was pretty messed up. <laughs> yeah. That was the one time I was kind of scared of Kane there. Okay. Uh, that's what stuck out to me. It's just kind of brutal. Mm-hmm. Mm. Uh, I I think for me it's it's when when Hob is just like attacking Lewis. I mean, you you just you realize what a sick sociopath this kid has turned into. Mm. Yeah, thanks, Kane. <laughs> yeah, I, I can only imagine how Kane raised him as a child. Oh man, like, yeah. And I assume it's not his child. It's just oh just yeah, a no, child. I, I, yeah, just a yeah. street urchin. Just, Somebody he found amusing or something. Yeah, like yeah. saw potential. Right. Um, but I, I w- would go back to uh, Doctor Fax, like for the idea of taking a sociopath to turn into a cyborg. Like again, it's like, what do you expect is going to happen? <laughs> and that's the interesting thing. Like, yeah. was her intent villainous? Right. Or just yeah. Misguided. <laughs> yeah. And if it's misguided, how did you get your? 
degree <laughs> yeah like, I don't, like how are you practicing that's what i and what are her clients like yeah like i assume hob is one of her clients now <laughs> like, right totally well-adjusted young man all right so what about her i believe there's a hero in all of us i just finally know what i have to do that keeps us honest i'm here to fight for truth and justice in the american way gives us strength you will give the people of earth an ideal to strive towards makes us noble and i know in my heart that it's right i'll go last oh, okay first so travis you want to go um most heroic i really liked uh when lewis was uh i think it was with the um, it, 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 during the moment or the sequence where RoboCop is, has been turned into a wimp, she uses uh, RoboCop as a human shield. Yeah. Um, with the, uh, baseball team. Okay. Okay. Coach. I couldn't remember yeah. if it was that one or not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it was. I, I like that. I like that. She's clever enough that she knows it's not going to hurt him, you know, but she, she uses RoboCop to get the job done and, and take out the, that guy. So it, I, I that like that. awesome. Yeah. I didn't even think about that. That was awesome. <laughs> Robo Shield. Yeah. Uh, for for me, I'm I'm gonna say uh, Robo's intro in the movie. I think the, okay. his first scene is is really terrific. I think, uh, uh, and and you know, you were talking about the music earlier, which is no patch on what Basil Polidori's did, but I think uh, the specific, you know thematic material that this movie introduces works really well with that particular intro scene. And so I, I do have a soft spot for that. Right on. I am going to go with a uh, shout out to uh, Lewis and the uh, balls to uh, run out there, or I should say ovaries to run out there and uh, grab that uh, armored truck and drive it right into King. Oh yeah. I thought that was her one giant hero moment. That's a good one. Yeah. And honestly, should have done more damage than it really did. But <laughs> yeah, but I, I loved every part of that. She's just like kicking off the OCP guy, <laughs> yeah. and jumping in, taking it out, crawling out, running away because she knows it probably didn't do anything. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, I, I just really wish I had more of her. Yeah. Yeah. But that was an awesome scene for her. All right. All right. I think the last thing left to do is uh, give it a rating and just, you know, kind of last thoughts on the movie and. Um, I'll, uh, I'll start us off. I'll say a, this is so hard. Uh, I'm going to say a three because I still like to watch it. I just don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, I kind of know cause I like bits and pieces on real, like a lot, but as a whole, it's just hard to defend. Um, but I can't go lower than a three without feeling bad about it. Hmm. So I'm, I'm going to go with three. I'm I'm with you. Out of five. I'm I'm with yeah. you. I'm exactly with you on the number and the reason. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's a hard one. Like thinking it through, it's probably like a two. <laughs> but <laughs> I really enjoy it still and uh, damn them for making me like something that's so horrible. <laughs> um, so that's my stance. What? And I I'm glad Zach is on my side when Travis says it's a one point two or something. <laughs> No, I'm actually at a two. Um, okay. Uh, because I, I don't have any history with this, you know. So for me, I, there was no nostalgia sure. there. Um, I, I barely had, you know, a lot of history with the original RoboCop. You know? mm. Now, while I did enjoy the original a lot more, there's still not enough nostalgia there for me to, mm. to have a special place in my heart for, for this franchise. Um, and like I said, there, there was – there's a lot that I did like, um, but like the, just, just so much of it just felt like I, like I talked about, you know, it, it was, it frustrated me, uh, so much. And sure. I thought about giving it a three, but then I thought, is this one middle of the road? It's like, not really. I think it's a little, for me, it's a little less than, than the middle. Like, I, I don't know that I would want to watch this again. And for me, like a, a good, like middle of the road should be. Something that I can throw on and just, you know, not care about and, and watch just whenever. And I don't know that I want to watch this one ever again. So, yeah, and that's I think why I gave it a three because I could just throw it on and have it in the background yeah. kind of film. I get that. I, I know but... that 
okay, this part's coming up, so I'm going to watch now. Mm. <laughs> like, it's one of those where it's like, sure. you can watch pieces of this. Uh, yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, in my head, I know it's more like what you're saying. But, yeah, maybe it is nostalgia, and I'm just some sad old man that likes it. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Well. Um, hey, I mean, son of a... <laughs> Well, RoboCop 2 gets a uh, 2.66, you know, repeating, so not... not 666? Yeah, yeah. Nice. All right. Uh, yeah, I, I kind of expected that. Yeah. Um, so. Patrick, do you remember when uh, when we did Dick Tracy? I, I had brought mm-hmm. in a lot of... Uh, or I found a pack of trading cards. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, <laughs> yes, I do. Well, I also, when I picked up the trading cards for Dick Tracy, I found a pack for RoboCop 2, so... Oh my god! So I'm gonna open this for the first time. Um, I'm okay. not doing video this time, but uh, yeah. it does come with a, a stick of gum. And oh man, Ugh. please eat it. Please eat it. <laughs> it snaps in half real good. Snaps. Real good. Comes with uh, a stick it's of like gum, dust. a sticker, and nine cards. So there's uh, definitely like a puzzle piece type card that has a part of uh, the like the left shoulder of RoboCop. Um, oh, geez. one of these says the robot warriors and it's got Kane, the Kane robot with Robocop. It's like he's, he's about to jump down onto him. Um, Ooh, this is cool. The storyboard standing tall. And it's like a artist, you know, it's like a, yeah, it's just a drawing of Robocop. So that's cool. Hmm. There's uh, the cop of tomorrow where the, the, this one's from Robocop cause it's the, the businessman bad guy from the first movie. It's not even from. <laughs> yeah, it, well, it, I, I pulled up the box, uh, the tops box, and it says, includes scenes from the first RoboCop movie. <laughs> okay. Oh, wow. Um, Some of my three ratings seems kind of bad when they couldn't even fulfill a card mm. set for the second movie. This is one that says, uh, get lost, RoboCop, and I think it's in the arcade. It's a bunch of, like, kids yeah. standing around around robocop um just an action shot it says helmeted hero of him like looking one direction but his gun is pointed the other the opposite direction so yeah it's a classic Ooh, shot. this one's definitely from the first movie it's murphy blown away and it's him like holding oh his hand God. his bloody hand out <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome um Another one, dented but undaunted. And I, I think this one's from the first movie. Um, and then a bad cop. So it's got RoboCop kicking Duffy in the in the gut. It looks like so. So yeah, I will take pictures of those and throw them on the Facebook page, which you can go you can find by going to the Real Comic Heroes League of Citizens, and I'll I'll share these uh, all these pictures of the cards, and uh, maybe I'll eat this gum later. We'll see. <laughs> Nope, eat it right now. <laughs> All right, I'm going to... We want to hear you vomit on Mike. Ooh, did you hear that snap? <laughs> oh, oh, Lordy. Oh, man. <laughs> Does it melt in your good. mouth? Oh, man, that's bad. Yeah, I've done some bubble gum from baseball cards from 90, and uh, it kind of melts in your mouth instead of turns into chewing gum. Yeah, so. <laughs> well, I'm... Yeah, we'll save some of that for later. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, uh, Zachy, we really appreciate you uh, joining us and for bearing with us f- during that. <laughs> <laughs> That—that's uh, what this is all about. I, don't know, I was just right. waiting for that. Yeah. Well, well, uh, little uh, tease for the future. I have one more pack of cards to open on a future episode. So. Oh, please say it's for Predator Two. Uh, sadly, it's not. But. Oh. <laughs> we will get to it soon. So. All right. If you want to hit your plugs and tell everyone, you know, where they can find you and what you're up to, uh, please feel free. Uh, yeah. So, well, well, again, yeah. I thank you once again, you guys for having me on. I, I, this is a movie that, that I, I love being able to talk about because I find it fascinating. So there's, there, the venues to do so are few and far between. So that was, <laughs> it, was a, it was a nice opportunity. Uh, if you, if you're interested in seeking me out, you can find me on Twitter at Zachy's Corner. That's Z-A-K-I-S Corner. That's also my website. If you just add a dot .com. I also write for the San Francisco Chronicle. I've got a fun piece coming up that uh, your oh. listeners might enjoy where I look at the pulp hero movies of the 1990s so dick tracy and the shadow and the rocketeer and uh phantom 
Um, nice. So that's right in your wheelhouse. And yeah. I also, uh, I host the movie film podcast, which drops twice a month. And I also host the nostalgia theater podcast, which drops once a month. And the most recent episode of that will be my conversation with writer, producer, Zach Stentz about the Terminator TV series, the Sarah Connor Chronicles. Ooh, nice. Very cool. Love that. Yeah. Nice. I'll do, uh, nice. I'll have to link to, uh, a bunch of that stuff and, uh, on the Facebook oh, yeah. page. So, Oh, that'd be great. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for sharing. You bet. Well, uh, yeah, this has been a lot of fun. Um, so our next movie review will be Predator 2. So that should be coming soon. We might have another episode between this episode and that one that won't be a movie review. Um, so, yeah, I think that's going to do it for this episode. Uh, again, thank you, Zachy, for joining us and hope to get you on another episode in the future. I hope so. so you're you're welcome back anytime. Um, uh, Patrick, anything else? No, I'd say uh, stay safe, citizens, but if uh, you're in the RoboCop universe, uh, good luck with that. (laughs) Here you go. It landed in the world's most forbidding jungle. It came for the thrill of the hunt. Now, it's coming to a different kind of jungle. Open season on all of us. Danny Glover, Gary Busey, Ruben Blades, Maria Conchita Alonso, Bill Paxton. Predator 2. Hunting season opens again this Christmas. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Find the show on Facebook and Twitter at Real Comic Heroes. All music and audio are the property of their respective creators. 